the epistle of Peter or the letter written by Peter's strangers in the world. That's the theme that we are pursuing from the letter. That's uh, one of the key truths that Peter is impressing on us again and again. Just to uh, get our minds back into the flow of this letter, Peter has taught us, he'll remind us again in chapter 2, we are strangers in the world, aliens, exiles, temporary residents. There are a number of ways that we could translate those words in First Peter. We are strangers because, well, let me ask you, why are we strangers? in the world. Yeah. Well, we're only here temporarily, so we're, we're moving on to a permanent. Moving on, we're moving on to our permanent residence. In chapter 1, described as our inheritance kept in heaven, which will never fade away, it'll never spoil, it will last forever. We are simply passing through, we might say, for however many years that the Lord gives us. And as we pass through, we seek to, above all, honor Jesus. In chapter 1, toward the, toward the uh, end of it, we have the command, Be holy as the Lord is holy. So daily, living as strangers, aliens, temporary residents of the world, we strive to reflect God's holiness in how we live. In chapter 2, Peter will, in some more directed ways, help us to understand how we do that as we live in the world like aliens <coughs> and strangers. We're starting at verse 4 in chapter 2 with a very, very rich section describing Christ and then how we relate to Jesus as aliens in the world. Let's do 4 through 8 together. I'll read and then we'll just talk through the questions together as we explore what God says to us here through the Apostle. Four through eight, I'm reading from NIV, 1984. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. <coughs> For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to, to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Let's stop there. We have, we have some rich imagery here. In fact, there'll be a lot of rich imagery in chapter 2, describing Jesus and describing us as followers of Christ. Let's together just take up each of these questions and explore what we're being told here by God's Spirit through the Apostle. Jesus is called here the living stone. The living stone. What comfort do you find in Jesus being called that? Look at, look at the passages, look at the image that's being developed here for us to contemplate. The living stone, what comfort do you find? Maybe we could simply start with the adjective living. What comfort do we find in that adjective for Jesus, living? Connecting it to the word stone, which it's a living thing. Okay, yeah, it's, a stone is not a living thing. It's kind of a... It's paradoxical, isn't it? Yeah, it's, yeah it's, this doesn't really seem to, to mesh, but it does with Jesus. So the living stone, and the stone takes us into the picture, which also involves us. But let's just, let's just kind of hover over the word living. Bill? It's alive. It's not a, a dead stone. It's alive. Not death. And it's a living, doesn't say, it delivers, it's living. Living now. Okay, living now, living forever. So uh, a, a reminder to us that the one in whom we believe and whom we follow while we live as strangers in the world, he's very much alive. He's alive right now. Right now. Um, uh, at the end of the 20th century, uh, Time Magazine had its person of the century. That wasn't that long ago. <laughs> the person of the century. 
and uh, people could write in and suggest candidates. Winston Churchill ended up being, I think, Albert Einstein, person of the century, as designated at that time. Uh, a lot of Christians wrote in and said, Christ. Christ should be the person of the century. And, and, and supposedly the response came back from people at the time, uh, this person has to have lived in the 20th century in order to qualify as the person of the century. And many Christians were saying, well, he does. He is alive in the 20th century. He's, he's living. He's living. And the most influential person in the 20th century was Jesus, like in the 19th and the 18th and the 17th. So he, he's the living stone. The one whom we trust is very much alive. Now, to stone, and, and Margaret, you, you, you very correctly, you know, a, a, a plant, an animal, stone, he's the living stone. What, what does that noun for Jesus communicate to us in the picture then that Peter's painting for us? He's the living stone. Well, where does, where does, where does he as the stone go? in the picture. He's not just a stone lying around somewhere, like out on a mountain. That's not the picture. Sandy? He's the cornerstone. The cornerstone for, for a building. So Peter is portraying to us uh, figuratively a building with Christ as the living stone forming the cornerstone of the building. Uh, I wish I wish John Tomo were here. He could he could enlighten us on on uh, building foundations and that. Uh, to my knowledge, builders don't really follow a cornerstone anymore. There are cornerstones to buildings that uh, will have some kind of inscription. Um, the seminary has a cornerstone in it that was taken from the previous seminary building. In ancient times, the cornerstone was often used to to measure off all the lines for the building. Tom? When my, my father built a house in the late 1950s, I watched him lay the cornerstone. The cornerstones, it was a cinder block cornerstone. Okay. They took a long time to do that. Oh, sure. And once it was done, the house was straight air. Okay. So then sometimes it's still used that way. Well, that was, I don't know if they do now. But uh, that maybe was, not. Yeah. That was, that was with houses, there. there's not really a cornerstone. But but with some buildings, there are, there are cornerstones. Jim? Even though there's not the cornerstone, they, they do select a point. Correct. And they build everything off of that point, otherwise Correct. You, you wouldn't have a house at 50. Correct. Years. You'd have a house with all the different angles, all these weird angles to it. Maybe like House in the Rock with all the different angles that that house has. So you need, you need, you need a cornerstone that's, that, that, that's true on all the angles so that the building that then is built off that cornerstone so it doesn't fall, it doesn't fall apart. All the angles are straight. So Christ, the cornerstone of this building, and this building is portrayed as a temple. And your minds, as Bible readers, goes back to Old Testament, the temple that God had Solomon build, and then that was um, rebuilt after it had been destroyed. It was, it was standing in Jesus' day, Herod's temple. Uh, what he had revamped from the previous temple. So Christ is, is the living stone, the cornerstone in this building. And I'm going to jump to number three as we pursue this entry. We'll come back to number two. What is our relationship to Christ, the living stone? We also fit into this picture. Right. Well, to go back to the analogy of the cornerstone, for the bricks that are forming the construction around it. Around, yes. Yeah. So the, the cornerstone has been laid, the living stone that's Jesus, and we are we are living stones or bricks or blocks, plural, that are built on the chief cornerstone. So we're alive in Christ. We will live eternally as Jesus will. And we form a part of this of this spiritual building. We would more commonly call this building the Holy Christian Church. All believers in Christ who rest on Jesus as the foundation. He's the cornerstone of the foundation. So we have we, we have we have this closeness to Christ 
We're connected to him through faith. We are living stones built on Jesus. The living stone. Tom? Uh, the Apostle Paul also emphasizes Christ as living, not dead, in Corinthians when he says that Jesus is resurrected from the dead. Otherwise, if he's not, he's a, then we're in a dead position. Uh, our, our faith and our preaching would be worthless and pointless, and we would still be in our sins. Mm -hmm. So there's the living uh, stone, uh, again, being emphasized. Right, right. If he were dead, uh, what, what kind of foundation would he really form for anybody's life? Might as well believe in somebody else or believe in yourself. But Jesus is alive, so he's, he's, he's the true cornerstone for the foundation of the Holy Christian Church. And we're part of it. We and we countless others. Remember, we don't know. We also call it the communion of saints and the creeds. Now, let's go back to number two. The, the apostle has a thing or two to say about Jesus here, which he'll expand on more uh, toward the end of chapter 2. How do his experiences, Jesus, the living stone, encourage us as strangers in the world? Peter says just a few things very briefly about Jesus here at the beginning of chapter 2. He was... Right? He says Christ was rejected but he's still precious to God. Still precious to God. And a lot. And a lot. Uh, we, our minds might go to the passion history, the many ways that Jesus was rejected by men. Uh, the, the Christians Peter was writing to were facing a lot of rejection. That'll come out more as we move along in 1 Peter. Uh, they, like the one on whom they were built, were often rejected by others. That happened to Christ. But God raised him from the dead. He is precious. He's alive. So for believers who suffer, because they are believers in Christ, we have, we have Jesus as the one we found, who was rejected, but vindicated by God through his resurrection. We too are always on safe ground with Jesus, no matter what kind of suffering we might face. Again, that, that'll come out more now as we move along to the town. Well, we, we were lost, and now we lost found. So we can make that application. Okay. And so he's trying to comfort those believers, too. Yes, yes. Uh, don't get down as you suffer for Christ. Look at the one you believe in. He too suffered as he came to save, but he's alive. So our faith rests on solid ground. <clears throat> Following the picture now of the building... And the purpose that we have, let's go back to number three. So we are connected to Christ through faith. We are living stones built on Jesus, the living stone, the cornerstone of the spiritual house, a temple. What does this mean for us? Or maybe to phrase it somewhat differently, what role do we then have as living stones in this building? Our role, Bill. We're a people belonging to Jesus. Okay, we belong to Christ. All right. That's very comforting. We belong to Jesus. Mm -hmm. We have a function too, and there's there's an Old Testament connection here. We may not always view ourselves this way. What are we since we are built on Christ? the holy priesthood yes yes we are a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ for first century believers especially first century Jewish believers this would have sounded rather provocative the priests were those from one tribe the Levites those who would offer the sacrifices were descendants of Aaron the first high priest <laughs> Not just anybody could go in the temple and offer sacrifices. If you belong, uh, if, if Ryan belonged to the tribe of Benjamin, he could not go to the temple, enter into the temple precincts, bring his animal, and offer it on the altar. He'd get in trouble. Get in trouble. Only the Levites could do that. Now, for us living in the New Testament era, 
living stones built on Jesus, the living stone. We are a priesthood, the apostle tells us, offering sacrifices. What are the sacrifices we offer? Not rams, not lambs, not bulls. What are we offering? Gives us, it gives us great dignity and meaning, Michelle. Our time, our talents. Our time, our talents. The money. The money, the treasures we have. Ourselves, our bodies, our souls. That's what we're offering to God day by day while living in the world. Uh, Romans 12 is another place that speaks about this. Offer, offer yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. It's a, it, it's a rich way to picture your life from day to day. You, you are a priest of God because you're a believer in Christ. And all you are doing, everything you're doing throughout the day is an offering, it's a sacrifice given to God in love and thankfulness for the fact that we belong to Christ. Isn't it in Hebrews where it further explains the royal priesthood? Or am I mistaken? And that's in Hebrews. It's in Hebrews it's uh, and in some other places too. Um, the term royal priesthood comes from this part of the Bible and uh, it will be stated a little bit farther down in chapter 2 here we speak about the priesthood of all believers we're all priests before God offering our spiritual sacrifices ourselves, our time, our talents, treasures our bodies, our souls day by day we have that, that, that special role from God each of us is a priest before God Martin Luther said something like, what's made us priests is baptism. We've been baptized into Christ, so we belong to Christ. Now every one of us is a priest of God, offering ourselves and everything God has given to us in obedience to our Savior. Any other questions or comments so far? There are a couple of Old Testament prophecies that are brought into this, into this discussion by Peter. Um, from Isaiah. Verse 6, Christ is called the chosen and precious cornerstone. In 7, he's also called the stone or the capstone. Uh, the imagery of the capstone is a stone that holds an arch in place. Um, Sometimes um, walk along the outside aisles of our sanctuary, and when you get up to the balcony area, you'll see, a, you'll see an archway there. And at the top is a stone holding the arch in place. That's a capstone. So Jesus is the capstone. Uh, for an archway, take away the capstone, it collapses. Jesus is what holds his church up. He's the capstone. Now I want us just briefly to talk about verse 8 because um, if you think about this passage, you might be troubled by it. Jesus is called a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. NIV is really saying a little bit too much there. I have some other uh, translations on your study sheet. Maybe you even have the, you have the EHV in front of you. EHV, a stone over which they stumble, and a rock over which they fall, or English Standard Version ESV, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. The thought in the passage is not that Jesus makes people not believe. The fault really lies with the person who does not believe. Jesus is not making people turn into unbelievers. Jesus never makes anybody sin because he's holy. But as people fail to believe in him, they stumble over Christ with the fault really lying with them. And then the end of that verse too, uh, you, know, you read that in NIV, which is also what they were destined for. The Bible does not teach that people are destined to be condemned. <clears throat> the Bible teaches us that we who believe, and everybody who believes, was predestined by God to believe. Ephesians 1 is a place in the Bible that teaches us that, Romans 8. We have God to thank for the fact that we are believers in Jesus, because he chose us before the creation of the world. The Bible nowhere teaches that God chooses people not to believe, or God chooses people to be condemned. The way this is translated, it might kind of sound that way. Uh, it says rather literally, for this God has appointed them. 
what has God appointed people for? If people don't believe, the consequence is that they are condemned. That's really what Peter is saying here. Um, he's, not, he's not blaming God for the fact that some people don't believe. He's not saying God has, has ordained from eternity that some are to be condemned. But they are if they don't believe. John? I think a little bit of this passage loses some of its color just okay. because of where society has gone. We don't, during this time, people were building temples to all kinds of gods. Statues of gods mm -hmm. were being erected. A, a normal sure. house didn't really have a cornerstone. A cornerstone was, you're building a coliseum, you're building a huge temple. There were festivals around that. Mm -hmm. So to be the architect that took the custom-built, ornate cornerstone for this massive project and reject that, then it, it's almost like saying you're committing social suicide, if you will. Okay. And that then becomes the stumbling block that just kind of cripples you all through your Good life. Point. So to re reject Christ as the cornerstone of the church becomes that crippling stumbling block all through your life. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, excellent point, Charles. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and relate this to our Savior himself and all the opposition he faced. Uh, he comes to his own people, God's Old Testament covenant people, all the promises, all the prophecies. He comes as the Savior for them. And then they they reject him. They call him Satan. <laughs> They're driving out demons by Satan. And they have put to death. The Savior of the world. He's the cornerstone. So there's no other way besides Jesus. It is the height of foolishness to reject the cornerstone of the church, just like somebody in ancient times Here's this excellent, perfect cornerstone. No, I think we're going to start over. Mm. Um, and, the, and the consequence then is rejection by God. So it really points out uh, the centrality of Jesus for our faith, the centrality of Jesus for the church. Jesus' centrality is the Savior of all. And apart from him, there is no salvation. So Peter certainly emphasizes those realities too. Other comments, questions? Let's move into uh, verses 9 and 10. Let's read, and then you can take a few minutes as a table to discuss the questions on our sheet. Here's some, some, some grand statements about us. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So take a, take a couple of minutes with you and your friends around you. List the several images and descriptions for believers. What does each tell us about ourselves? Six, what purpose are we to fulfill? Seven. For what reason alone can we claim these images and descriptions for ourselves?
not all the time, but show another time. Where are you going? 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 Number five. Let's talk together, everybody. Let's take each of these images. What does each image tell us about ourselves? The priest took away a lot of their clothes. First one. We'll take them one at a time. First one. Chosen people. So what does that tell us about ourselves? Or to ask an additional question. What do you find comforting about this description? Chosen people. Called us out of the darkness into the light. Called us out of darkness into his light to become his people. So we don't live in spiritual darkness. <clears throat> We live in God's light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who walks in me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Justin? Pat, is this also an allusion back to the Old Testament where God called his people out of Egypt, but now it's not just the Jewish people or the Israelites who are God's chosen people, now it's all of us? It's all believers, Jews and Gentiles. Together. <laughs> exactly, exactly. The Israelites... For an era in God's plan of salvation were God's chosen people. Chose the Israelites, descendants of Abraham. And, and I think that helps us also flesh out the word chosen. Why did God choose them? It was his choice. It was all grace. There's nothing special about that race of people. Why has he chosen us? All grace, all mercy, nothing special about us. He's called us out of darkness into his light and now we are God's people living here on the earth. God's chosen people. Next one. And we've we've chewed on this quite a bit already. Next next description. Mercy. Well that's that's seven. That's seven. Sorry about that. That's fine. That's fine, Ryan. Royal priesthood. Okay. Uh, let's let's just uh, uh, chew on the royal part of that. We've already talked about our, our role as a priesthood. What's in it, what's the name about royal priesthood? We're a royal priesthood. None of us has any roots in royalty. We're all Americans after all. We don't have kings and queens. But we are a royal priesthood. Because, Brian? Well, they were elevated above the rest of the population. Sure. Held in high regard. Sure, high regard. We're, we're priests of the king, Christ, who's our king. Royal priesthood. So we have a high and, and noble calling as priests of God. Next one. And these, there's kind of some crossover with some of these terms. Next one. We are a holy nation. Now this is not talking about the United States of America. It's talking about the Christian church, a holy nation. How are we holy? Yeah. The blood of Christ is the blood of Christ. Yeah. We're, an, we're an army of believers. An army of believers purified by Jesus' blood, a holy nation. And then a people belonging to God. This kind of goes back to chosen nation. Uh, the ancient Israelites, God selected them to belong to Him. We're a people belonging to God as we live in the world. Very, very exalted titles for us. What purpose are we to fulfill? The purpose then? Holy nation, raw priest, priesthood, people belonging to God, chosen nation, a purpose. So, declare praises to Declare God's praises. So what we say, it's, it's our lifestyle, everything we do. It's, it's not only what we say about what we believe, in other, in other words, communicating our faith, but it's everything we do. 
is always a matter of declaring God's praises. And then the reason, now Joyce, the reason we can claim these images and these descriptions for ourselves mercy. Mercy. God's mercy. Once we had not received mercy, now we have. God's mercy in Christ which has made us who we are. And whenever we contemplate the fact that we are who we are because of God's mercy, gratitude just floods our hearts. All God's mercy is feeling for us in our need and then acting on those deep feelings for us in our needs. Let's move on to verses 11 and 12 together. We come once again to the theme for Peter. 11 and 12, I'll read. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Again, we are reminded we are strangers, aliens, living in the world. That fact has a direct bearing on all the commands that follow. And there'll be some specific areas of life that Peter addresses. And each of them, the fact that we are aliens and strangers, guides us in how we live in those roles. What lifestyle are we to pursue then, since we are aliens and strangers? <clears throat> there are at least two components to it. One is on a very personal level. As aliens and strangers, how would we conduct ourselves? Are you um, yes. living a good uh, lifestyle, uh, even amongst the pagans, so that they can eat? For example, you okay, said. all right. That, that, that's one of the two components. So outwardly, live such good lives that others will praise not us, but praise God. And Resisting temptation. So that's the very personal way that we live as aliens and strangers in the world. Daily, we are confronting the desires of our flesh. Nobody's necessarily seeing that. We are told to abstain from them because they war against our souls. We are aliens and strangers as we deal with the temptations of the flesh. We are, we are to get rid of them with God's strength and power. Now we come into some areas of life where Peter had much to say to them as he does to us today too. First of all, we would say as citizens of our worldly country, how should we live? Uh, I'm going to read, then you, you can have a couple of minutes to look at some questions here. 13 through 17. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brethren of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. Take a couple of minutes with your friends around you. How do we pursue our lifestyle as citizens? What principles do we find here about government? Here's another paradox presented by the apostle. How do we live as free people and as servants of God all at the same time? And this is one for more discussion. Peter doesn't necessarily address all of this in 13. What challenges do we face as we strive to live in this way among the pagans? And you may have a number of answers that go beyond what Peter writes here. We've got a couple of minutes, again, do some talking, do some reflecting.